Well, here it is. Here it is, you guys. The time is right. The time is now. The time is for you to meet Team Jester. Everybody out there in YouTube land, Jake of the One Man Band is back again, and it is time for me to introduce you guys to my personal OC team for Ruby, that is Team Jester. Alrighty, so let's get into talking about the characters first, and then I'll kind of talk about the team as a whole and how they kind of all fit in into the universe that is Ruby. So, let's start off with the leader of Team Ruby, Josh Sanguin. He's the good-natured, over-enthusiastic, and natural-born leader of Team Jester. Yet, he doesn't hold any punches when it comes to combat. When combat comes around, Josh becomes the serious, strategic, and calculative leader that he needs to be for his team. Though he's been known to employ some very strange strategies in his battle, his team always comes back in one piece. Outside the battlefield, Josh loves to drag his team along on going on just strange and abnormal adventures, normally dragging Sergei along because Sergei's the kind of guy that wants to just sit down and just stay calm, while Josh is most is mostly the exact opposite, wanting to drag Sergei along, you know, taking him to whatever place when Sergei would just like to prefer to stay in his own little world. Basically, Josh is the energetic and confident, and he isn't afraid to back down from any challenge or any type of enemy that may come his way. Alright, here's some basic background information on Josh. Josh grew up in one of the nomadic tribes outside of the Kingdom of Vacuo. His tribe was always moving from oasis to oasis, either searching for food or water or shelter, or running from the creatures of Grimm. Josh was always an adventurous child, exploring caves, running around the Kingdom of Vacuo when his tribe had stopped inside the kingdom to gather supplies, and he often explored desert caves far away from the safety of his tribe, taking along his childhood friends with him, and this actually led to a little bit of trouble in his past with the creatures of Grimm. It was during one of these expeditions into a cave where he discovered his semblance, and then once returning back to his tribe, he was told by the village elder that he had a great power, and with that power he was supposed to protect the world with it. And taking those words, he left his tribe and went to uh, Vacuo's uh, huntsman school which then he started to train there and after a few years of training there he then applied for Beacon Academy and then was accepted and soon became the leader of Team Jester. Josh's weapons are two shields that do, even though they do have a round body they have six prongs sticking out of them thus forming the shape of a star. Now there are two separate rows of these prongs and what they do is they rotate against each other. One rotates clockwise, the other rotates counterclockwise, creating a form of chainsaw type deal with his shields, which he then uses to slice up creatures of Grimm and to also block and destroy enemy weapons. With his shields, with that rotation ability, he can plunge them into the ground, and when using his semblance as well as uh, the motorization of his shields, he can actually roll around the battlefield quite quickly, kind of like his own little... Th th they kind of form wheels. He just lifts up his legs, thrusts his arms into the ground, and rides around on the battlefield so he can get from point A to point B in a very small amount of time. His shields names are Jericho and Jordan. 
Jericho is on his left arm, and Jordan is on his right arm. Josh's semblance, it's a form of earth manipulation. It's not like dust manipulation. It's a lot like Glenda Goodwitch's telekinesis, only his is strictly uh, based to earth, such as rock and sand and things along those lines. It's He's kind of like an earthbender in, in a way. Now, even though him using his semblance in this way uses up a lot of his energy, he's able to form shields, send uh, rocks flying at high velocity to form his ranged weapons, and uh, when he's working together with Ryder, he's able to keep this up for a very long time. Due to Ryder's semblance ability of being able to, uh, amplify her aura into other people. And also, while using his semblance and thrusting his shields into the ground, he's able to travel at fast distances, uh, across the battlefield and also use it, f uh, to attack. Now, even if he's not near any sort of sort of earth that's why he has vials and pouches all on his belts and his uh ver braces and all that stuff he always has some earth on him that way if need be he can just pop open one of those vials or open up one of his pouches and boom he has some stones or he has some sand that he can use for weapons <laughs> Josh Sanguin's inspiration comes from the character Joshua in uh, the Bible stories or the, the Torah or, you know, he's in multiple different kind of texts. Basically, Joshua was one of the um, Israelites that was taken out of Egypt by Moses and he was one of Moses's like right-hand men in a way. He was one of the scouts that went into the land of Canaan and actually came back and was one of the only two that was confident that they would be be able to defeat them. Everyone else was totally against it and were like, no way. But he had the confidence and the you know, the faith in the in God that they would be able to defeat the Canaanites. And this plays into Josh Sanguine's overconfidence and being able to overcome any obstacle. That comes from uh, Joshua. And also, once Moses had died, Joshua then became the leader of the Israelite uh, tribe, and he led the conquest into the land of Cana. He brought down Jericho's walls, he crossed the Jordan, thus leading into the names of his weapons, and uh, he then led the tribe of Israel to wipe out all the Canaanites and then create Israel and take the promised land as themselves. Sergei is the quiet brooding member of Team Jester. He only really speaks when spoken to. He doesn't really like to uh, just jump into any conversation. He likes to listen and observe, which kind of goes into his whole fighting style and him kind of being a sniper. He doesn't really take his uh, school classes seriously due to the fact that he believes that everything he needs to know and learn, he can l learn by living life and just experiencing it out in the field not by sitting in a classroom and reading books. Out of all the members of Team J Jester, he's always the one that's serious, and whenever he tries to joke or anything along those lines, it's often met with awkward silence because he's either tried too hard or he's just overstepped the boundary, or he just doesn't hasn't added a punchline in anything. Since Sergei is a faunus, and a reptilian faunus at that, his his type of faunus is actually very rare. He's a chameleon type faunus. And it's due to that that his eyes can actually move independently from one another. And this often puts people off. So he normally wears sunglasses wherever he goes. That way people aren't put off by his eyes drifting from one place to another. And also, he has uh, horns coming out of his forehead that uh, proclaim him as being a faunus. 
But him being a faunus, it doesn't affect him in any way how some people are racist against faunus and don't like faunus at all. He normally just ignores them or just sets them straight. He's that kind of person. He doesn't want, want to really cause any trouble, but when trouble has already been caused, he likes to finish it, especially when it comes to fellow faunae. Sergei grew up outside of the kingdoms and the northeastern uh, section of the region of Mantle. His village was, a, was very small and their main export was sheep's wool. And his family had been shepherds of sheep for many generations. And due to him being the youngest child of the family, his father was already training his much older siblings in the form of uh, protecting the sheep, herding the sheep, shepherding the sheep, all that kind of stuff. So it was his grandfather that took Sergei under his wing and then uh, trained him in all these different and all these different survival tactics to hunt, to defend against the creatures of Grimm, how to use his aura in a in certain ways. Uh, his grandfather had actually fought in wars prior. Uh, so his grandfather was a warrior in his uh, y younger years, but now that he was old, he had taken up being, he had gone back to being a shepherd uh, with the rest of his family. But so, but when Sergei was 10, his grandfather passed away. And it was then that Sergei took up his grandfather's shepherding staff and also his rifle, which then became his, and he traveled off, uh, he he left his family to travel uh, throughout the world to find work and to uh, continue to further his skills. It's during many of these adventures that he took odd jobs in protecting caravans, um, helping defend against creature or grim attacks, and he was even offered to join the White Fang a couple of times. But during one excursion where he actually was thinking about joining the White Fang, he was asked to assassinate one of the head uh, members of the Schnee Dust Company. And it was during this that he decided that it wasn't for him because he wasn't going to kill anyone that didn't deserve it. So he quickly um, knocked out the White Fang members that were with him, he tied them up, reported them to the authorities, and disappeared uh, back into the world where the White Fang never bothered him again. Uh, when he was about 18, he decided that he was going to go and join uh, one of the academies, but he went straight for the big one. He went for Beacon Academy because that's what somebody had told him to do. Uh, some random person who he met on the street after he had saved him said, you should go join uh, and become a huntsman at Beacon Academy. So he went. Now he passed the um, actual entrance exam with flying colors, but all the written exams and all the the testing on paper that he had to do, he did have trouble with. He was just barely able to scrape by and became the second member of Team Jester. Sergei's weapon, his shepherding staff, is called Pastuka Dolg. Now, it's Russian, and I'm not sure if that's the correct translation. It's a very rough translation. I put it through Google Translation. But it basically translates out to Shepherd's Duty. And what it is, is it's a shepherding staff that unfolds into an um, anti-tank rifle sniper rifle. Now, if Ruby's Sniper Scythe Crescent Rose was supposed to be like a 50 caliber, this, his sniper rifle really is an anti-tank rifle. His rifle can put a dust round through a giant death stalker, like um, Coco's weapon, how it totally ripped that uh, giant death stalker apart when she started using the uh, minigun aspect of her weapon. It would be like that, but with only one bullet. It would just go straight through and kill it. That's why, as a fighter, he prefers to stay in a fixed position where he can provide supporting fire to the rest of his team. And also, uh, find certain locations, scout out the, uh, the battlefield or the area that they're about to go into, and uh, take out any big grim that might be coming toward his team. 
but he isn't no pushover when it comes to melee combat either. He uses his shepherding staff as a form of bow staff to just beat the heck out of any grim that comes out of his way, and he uses the blunt force of his weapon, uh amplified by the firing of his uh, shepherd staff to amplify the damage that his melee combos can do. Sergei's semblance fits him perfectly. He's able to amplify his aura out to a certain distance around him and bend the light around himself to render himself invisible. He's able to do some form of active camouflage. So, and not only that, he also masks his sound and his scent. So he can be lying in an area and a grim creature or a, or a hostile enemy can walk right by his position and not know he's there. Now, he's able to amplify that to a uh, a little bit of distance around him with the help of Ryder, which he then uses to hide his entire team, which really helps with their whole scouting and infiltration aspects of their team. Sergei's inspiration is Vasily Zatevsev, and if you don't know who that is, I'm not, I'm not blaming you in any way. Who Vasily was? He was a Russian sniper during World War II, and uh, he was most prominent in the Battle of Stalingrad, where he uh, uh, killed enemy officers, enemy troops, and even won battles with German snipers, even killing the best German sniper um, in <laughs> all of in uh, the whole war. He was in a sniper battle with him and came out alive and beat him. Uh, he was responsible for over 225 confirmed kills during World War II. Uh, if you want, like, a further explana explanation on who this guy was, look up the movie Enemy at the Gates. And uh, that movie is basically about his campaign in the city of Stalingrad. So, uh, he was just a... I like that movie so much, and that's just a big inspiration because he was a uh, famous sniper, so I decided that he was going to be the inspiration for my sniper-like character in Team Jester. Tanya Panzerfaust, she is the brains and the, the spunky uh, short girl of Team Jester. She isn't afraid of showing off and showing everyone that she's more intelligent than everyone. And she's very cocky like that, and that often gets on people's nerves. Now, she doesn't really do this to belittle people, but she does do it in a way that makes it seem insulting when she's boasting about how smart she is or how good she is at something. She does it in a way that seems like she's bragging when she often doesn't mean it like that. Now prior to coming to Beacon Academy, her uh, butler Darius was the only moral support that she really had while growing up. So this makes her really closed off and recluse um, with her feelings to her team. She isn't one to just open up with saying that she's having a hard time or she's having trouble with something to her team. But as time went on, she was able to open up to her team even more, even though she does have trouble uh, sometimes still with this aspect. Now, she is like the prankster of the team and of the classes she's normally in. She likes to play little pranks that cannot be traced back to her because she's too smart for that. But she don't do it to hurt anybody, she just wants to be the class clown and get some laughs out of it. Now this may sound odd, but Tanya actually comes from a rich and well-respected Faunus family in Atlas. Her father uh, worked hand-in-hand -hand with developers in uh, Ironwood's army and the Shinee Dust Company in modeling robots and mechs and weaponry for the military and the Shinee Dust Company. Now, Tanya did in inherit her father's genius, but she never really gets her father's praise due to him working all the time. And during her young life, her butler Darius was the only 
person who really had any moral support, gave her any moral support, and she, he was really the only person she was able to talk to. Now, it was Darius that taught um, Tanya what was right and what was wrong and how to respect other people and how to not uh, use your position as a way to belittle others. He was able to teach uh, Tanya that since she was a faunish, she's going to enter a world where a lot of people aren't going to like her just due to who she is. And he was able to teach that to her without her learning it in the uh, actual world and then just being crushed by that. And it was due to Darius's influence that she should use her genius and her position to help people that she decided to become a huntress. <laughs> Alrighty, Tanya's weapons. Now, her base weapons are dual tonfas that when that are, uh, are infused with burn dust to perform explosive damage while using them in melee combat. These dual tonfas are called uh, Schlagen and Bruise, but when combined, they form Shrek, which forms a rocket launcher type weapon, which she uses to attack enemies from afar and uh, use it to just deal tons of damage. Think of Nora's grenade launcher, but amplified about twice that size because it's an actual rocket launcher and kind of like Junior's weapon, sort of, only not a bat and dual tonfas. And the last weapon that uh, Tanya really has is Jaeger, her mobile um, suit of armor slash companion. When she was really young, she was... Uh, and down in her father's workshop, she got a hold of an old um, endoskeleton of one of the robots he was working on. Now, he wasn't using it, and he, he just gave it to her because, you know, I don't want you to bother me. Go play with whatever. And so she took that and then built it up, built it into a suit of armor, and actually gave it a small form of artificial intelligence. Now, this uh, suit of armor um, can actually wrap itself around her and become her combat armor uh, during combat. When she is inside her Jaeger armor, that not only uh, boosts her defense up, but also um, there's a whole bunch of small weapons on it, such as a small dust flamethrower, and it is able to sustain a small amount of... Uh, uh, limited flight. Or when she's outside of the armor, Jaeger can actually be another combatant. It is programmed with very basic combat cues and it is a able to use her weapons uh, almost as efficiently as she can. Now this really uh, plays in when she actually has to use her semblance during a combat situation. Tanya's semblance takes a lot of concentration and a lot of patience. Basically, what she can do is, if she's, if she's able to concentrate hard enough, she can predict the movements of an enemy or a group of enemies. It's kind of like some sort of psychic power seeing into the future. That way she's able to use this knowledge to help form strategies with the rest of her team. Now, she can do this while in combat, but it takes a lot of concentration and a lot of energy out of her. She does prefer to use it before combat or after combat, or when she's not in combat at all. Thus, Jaeger being a combat droid, defending her while she is using her semblance to map out enemy movements. Tanya's inspiration actually comes from two people. The first one is Field Marshal Erwin Rommel a.k.a. the Desert Fox. He was one of the lead military commanders of Nazi Germany in World War II. Now, I know what you're thinking, oh, he was a Nazi, he was a bad person. Now, maybe, maybe he was, pro he was fighting for bad morals, but him himself was an actually an excellent strategist. If he would have gotten his way and gotten the supplies that he requisitioned, he probably could have uh, made the war go on for a few more years or have even had Germany 
win the war. And then the second person that Tanya's inspiration comes from is Tony Stark, aka Iron Man. That's where her genius and her Jaeger combat uh, armor comes into play. She has a personality a lot like Tony Stark, but she's a gender bent. She's a girl and a fox faunus. Desert Fox from Erwin Rommel. There you go. Ryder Pennyworth. Now, she spent most of her younger years uh, with the boys rather than the girls. Although growing up in a very um, presumptuous and ladylike household, she often went out with her father and her brothers and her uncle uh, Peter. Peter Port is her uncle, by the way, and she went out to go on adventures and went on safaris and hunts with her with her male uh, family members to go and hunt the creatures of Grimm. And this caused an entire shift, really, in her behavior. Even though she's a uh, lady and comes from a very long line of very um, ladylike women, she, her manners are really lacking, and she has a mean temper. She is the person to really throw the first punch and start the bar brawl. But she is able to take criticism rather well. She doesn't really care what other people think of her, but when other people start messing with the people around her, that's when she starts to get mad. Even though Ryder doesn't want to admit it, she has a very motherly um, feel about her team and for other people. She cares for other people and wants to take care of them. Now it's due to her having spent more time in the field, a lot like Sergei, than most of the other second year students at Beacon Academy, that she feels that uh, she's on a higher level than them, she has more experience out there with them, but her people skills are a little lacking. Once again, she doesn't really have all that good of manners, and when it comes to fancy dress parties, she is completely out of her comfort zone. Which normally happens because her mother is always dragging her back to the estate to go to balls and formal gatherings, and she drags along the rest of her team during this, and that causes a lot of hysteria at some of these parties, I'll tell you what. Ryder comes from a long line of expert grim hunters, at least on the male side. The ladies' side of her family are the people who take care of the estate and do economics. They're very ladylike. They, I, I, I don't really know how to put it. They're like the, the leading lady example of the world if that makes any sense. But she really took more to the male side of her family's craft with much, much gusto. She likes, she, in her younger years, she always was going on hunts and safaris with her father and her uncle, Port, uh, Peter, Peter Port, you know. And it was during these excursions and due to the fact that Port was a teacher at Beacon Academy that she decided that she was going to become a huntress. So after a few years of training at one of the uh, lesser combat schools, she then applied for Beacon Academy and became the fourth and final, final member of Team Jester. Now Ryder's chief melee weapons are her dual machetes, Ivory and Dahahabu. Now, Dahahabu is actually, it translates into gold, into, from Swahili, I think it was, but um, one of them is uh, obviously white, that one is ivory, and the other one has a goldish tint. Now, due to the fact that they are machetes, they are uh, slashing and cutting weapons rather than uh, stabbing weapons, and... When combined with her revolver, they form uh, barrels, and her revolver then becomes a, a double-barreled shotgun, or a double-barreled rifle, if you will. Now, on the realm of her revolver, her revolver's name is Solomon. It is a 
dual action, double barrel, double cylindrical revolver. Very custom, very weird design. It's in my head and uh, I just can't really explain it besides the fact that it has dual, dual cylinders and dual barrels and obviously two triggers, much like the uh, trigger mechanism on a double rifle. And it's when combined with her two uh, machetes that it becomes the double-barreled rifle called uh, Ivory Solomon or uh, Ivory Golden Solomon. Now she normally uses uh, dust burn rounds in her uh, in her gun, but she can trade those out for specialty rounds such as ice or uh, electricity or anything along those lines. Now, Ryder's semblance is actually the cohesive glue that makes them such an effective team. She was born with an abnormal amount of aura. She just, she's overflowing with aura. Now, uh, it took a long time for her to be able to control the outflow of her aura, but she is able to transfer her own aura power into uh, other people or other um, conduits of aura. So she can turn a weapon into a mega powerful weapon. She can uh, help shield somebody if their aura is low. She can rejuvenate somebody if their lo of their aura is about to run out. She so she acts a lot like a a medic and a support person for her team. Even though when it actually comes to combat situations, she likes to be right there in the thick of it, fighting with her team both in melee and in ranged combat. Now, Ryder Pennyworth's inspiration comes from the fictional character Alan Quartermain, most uh, likely known for being the main protagonist in the book King Solomon's Mines and he is also a character in the movie League of Extraordinary Gentlemen where he is played by Sean Connery. Now uh, Ryder Pennyworth is obviously a gender-bent version of Alan Quartermain. Now what now Alan Quartermain was a, a safari hunter and a, an explorer which really goes into a writer's personality and what she loves to do. Now also one of the qu quirks about Alan Quartermain is that he was blessed and or cursed by a African witch doctor where uh, Africa would not allow him to die. Now he has been killed but he has come back to life due to this a uh, blessing because he saved the witch doctor's which translates into her uh, semblance ability. She's able to save others from death as well as herself due to the abnormal amount of aura that she possesses. Alrighty now. Team Jester. They're a second year team at Beacon Academy so they're in the same class, if you will, as Team Coffee, they are a, a scouting, infiltration, and hard-hitting team. They have gone on many missions where they've taken on legions of grim creatures and have come back in one piece due to all of them working together and their, uh, uh, their abilities and semblances all coming together and being able to uh, plan the Grimm's movements, to evade certain Grimm when they needed to, and to just totally destroy entire legions when, the, when it came down to it. Alrighty guys, I think that's really all I can really talk about Team Jester with you guys. I mean, that's really everything that I have on them. Everything that I've really thought about them. There is, like, some story ideas in my brain that I have, but I guess we'll have to save those for the fanfics that are gonna, may or may not come out. But, I just hope you guys enjoyed, and hey, I thank you guys for actually sitting down and listening to me ramble on a, about a bunch of characters that I came up with myself. But, I mean, OC characters in the Ruby universe, they're... They're a joy to make because since Ruby is such a big and dynamic uh, uh, universe, 
that these um, teams and characters can very much exist along the line of the main uh, story plot characters due to the fact that there's so many students, so many teams, and all that good stuff. So, now that I've done this, will I do another OC video where I take a look at your guys' OCs? Maybe? But hey, I'm just finally glad to get uh, my OC team finally out there in the thick of things. So, I guess all that I have to do now is wait and sit, read your guys' comments on how you think my team either sucks or is cool or anything along those lines, and I guess... I can patiently wait to see if anybody gets a fanfic idea. But until then, this has been Jake of the One Man Band, and this has been Team Jester. So, I hope you guys enjoyed once again. Be sure to check out these other videos that are going to be popping up on the screen for you if you uh, want to go check those out. And there's going to be lots of more Ruby stuff coming out to you guys soon. So, uh, be a good person, tip your waitresses, keep moving forward, I'll see you guys next time I'm out there in YouTube land. And when it comes to Team Jester, all of them may be funny in their own right, but in a way, they all represent me just a little. So I'll see you guys next time. Yeah, yeah.